Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to Character Building. I'm Lauren Kennedy Brady. I'm the Producing Artistic Director of Theater Raleigh, and I know we kept you waiting, but it is going to be worth the wait. Tonight, we have Tony winner, Kelly O'Hara. She is here to talk to me about building character, what it takes to be as awesome as she is and to stay at the top of her game. I cannot wait to have her out here and chat with her and also invite three aspiring artists out to talk to her and ask her a question as well. And we're going to get to see some really fun videos of her and some maybe um, blackmail inducing photos from her childhood. We'll see how the night goes. <laughs> but we are very, very happy to have her. And we're, of course, happy to have you tuning in. Thank you so much. I know it's Golden Globe night, so thank you for being here instead of that. Um, so I wanted to, before we get going and bring her out, I would like very much to thank First Citizens, they are our virtual theater experience sponsor. We couldn't be bringing you all these awesome virtual theater experiences without them. Also, while you're here, um, you want to donate to Theater Raleigh, we would appreciate the help getting us through this crazy, weird, dark time um, and hopefully safe on the other side of this pandemic. And while you're here on YouTube, subscribe to our theater, I mean, so our YouTube channel so you can see all the cool things that we have coming up. But let's, let's get right to it, you guys. Here she is, seven-time Tony nominee and... Tony winner, ladies and gentlemen, Broadway sweetheart, Kelly O'Hara. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. I'm so happy to see you. It's so nice to see you too. I'm sorry I for mean, my technical problems. That's me, guys. All I know. <laughs> you are so fine. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Um, this new world we live in, it's all about connection, but it's really kind of hard to connect sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly true. Yeah. Um, I'm so thrilled that you're here. It's such a coup for us. It's such an honor to have you on to get to talk about your life and your career. And so thank you for taking the time out of your busy life with your children and your family. And I know you're doing something pretty awesome too. Aren't you filming something? We'll talk about that later, maybe. <laughs> yeah, okay, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> Um, well, I like to usually start the show with sort of doing a like Kelly O'Hara, This Is Your Life, going a little bit through um, your amazing credits. I feel like I researched that you have done 12 Broadway shows. Is that right? I think I, it's just 11. But, oh, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. I miscounted. But that's a ton of shows and kind of amazing. Um, starting with your Broadway debut was Jekyll and Hyde, right? Indeed. Yes. And then you went on to be a replacement in Follies, the revival of Follies. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, no one should ever forget Dracula, the musical. <laughs> and then, of course, Which I believe, I believe when they made the cast <laughs> album, you took over my part. Oh, my Lord. Well, I had at one point been a placeholder for you, I believe, in one of the uh, readings. <laughs> so um, then you went on, of course, to do The Light in the Piazza, which really solidified your star on Broadway. There you are, gorgeous girl. And um, uh, Pajama Game with a uh, little just small star named Harry Connick Jr. <laughs> Super cool. And then another star, Matthew Broderick in Nice Work If You Can Get It. Mm -hmm. And of course, you uh, did South Pacific with a star, Charlie Brady, my husband. You did that with him. Yes. And, <laughs> and the Bridges of Madison County. Oh, my Lord. That mm -hmm. show. Cannot wait to talk to you about that. Yes. And then you won your Tony Award for The King and I. Yep. There you are, gorgeous, mm -hmm. so stunning. And then, last but not least, I believe you uh, made quite a splash in the revival of Kiss Me Kate. Mm -hmm. What a stunning, like, just quickly went through your seven Tony nominees, <laughs> nominations. Weren't those it, like, for those shows? Yeah, those last ones, yeah. I mean, I'm, like, Kelly, come on. What is it like when you are, uh, I guess let me just ask right away, the first time you were nominated for a Tony for The Light in the Piazza, I mean, what was that feeling like? I mean, listen, I, that was, it was, it was like heaven. It was just like being invited to the big, the neatest party and being included. And, you know, if you ever, if any of you ever felt excluded in your life, which I think most of, most of us have, it's, it's this weird feeling and you keep telling yourself, I mean, I think with even with Light in the Piazza being my first, I didn't even have the talk of, you don't need that. Don't worry about that. It was more like, I just didn't even expect, like, I didn't even yeah. see it coming. I, I, in the beginning, you really don't. I, I was pretty naive. I, 
I never saw the Tonys as a kid. The first Tonys I ever watched were, were the year Kristen Jenner was one and thanked our teacher, Mrs. Birdwell. And I love I just, that. Um, yeah, and so it wasn't, the fact that I was in a show, that I had been in Broadway shows, that was it for me. And so it was this incredible gift on top of everything else. You know. That's awesome, because I did want to ask, you know, you were nominated seven times. I mean, that is an incredible accomplishment. First of all, it's an amazing accomplishment just to get on Broadway, sure. not to mention play incredible roles like you have, but then also to be nominated and recognized by the community so many times. Um, that has just got to be amazing. Did you, did it ever, though, uh, lose, did you ever lose perspective and be like, oh, yeah, there's another Tony nomination? <laughs> <laughs> My God, I hope not. No, put me in the, I'm sure put in a box and send me out to see if that's the case. You know, they, they all came with their different uh, bits of bits of weight. You know, it, they were all so joyous, and so I was. I've been grateful every single time. You know, it's the most. I, I pinch myself. I cannot believe it. But there were many times I was nominated, but my partner wasn't. Mm. Or many times I was nominated, but my sh you know, or one time I, I was nominated, but my show closed and. They always had these different feelings. For me, the reason I got into theater, the reason I love it so much is the family aspect of it, the collaboration. Um, I just, that's all it is for me. It's this, it's this absolute non-solo entity in my life is to be in the theater. You know, it's all about this group. And so there were, there were years there that, yes, I was elated and, you know, down on my knees with gratitude, but at the same time, it can be a lonely experience because you carry guilt you carry uh, the expectation then, you know, of, of then losing, you know, to disappoint or you feel like you might disappoint. And of course you don't, but like your parents or your friends or your, you know, you have the, then you start building up this pressure of like, gosh, I don't want to be Susan Lucci of Broadway. You know, it's like, um, so it's filled with all these emotions. It's, it's not just joy, but my gosh, it's joy, you know, so I can't, uh, but I never, I never and will never say, eh, just a, Another, no. you know. You certainly don't seem like the kind of person that would ever do that. It was certainly said as a joke. I, I mean, because I really look at you, too. I mean, you have consistently stayed on such a high level all these years. I mean, I've known you or at least seen you in hallways auditioning for stuff. I mean, for 20 years. Yeah. And you have always remained incredibly gracious, such a level head, even as your star rose and rose and rose and rose. Your kindness was always there, and you always had such an open heart, and such a, you were so inspiring. And um, it, it's just, you know, it's really amazing. And I've just said inspiring, but I'll say it again. It was inspiring to watch that. Well, thank you. No, we're southern, we're southern ladies, Lauren. We can't That's drop right. that. We can't drop that. <laughs> we, were uh, we were brought up right. Yeah, and you know what? I never, I never expected. I, I don't live in life that way at all. I'll never assume that I'm owed anything. Every single thing that I have, not only did I feel like I had to try to earn it, but after having gotten it, I feel like I have to be deserving of all that all the time. And some of that's burdensome. Some of that is a burden. Sure. I, I wish that I wasn't so suspicious of joy all the time. You know, I, <laughs> I wish that I actually just could say, this is awesome. And I do for the moment. And then I go, oh, I gotta get back to work and, and prove that I'm worthy of those types of things. I think that's a really interesting way to put it because, you know, you know, we're both parents. I talk to my daughter all the time about um, wanting her to have humility, but also not dimming her light, like wanting her to feel like it's okay to be talented, it's okay to shine, mm -hmm. um, as long as you understand what comes with it or, you know, I don't even know what she's going to do with her life. She doesn't necessarily want to follow in my footsteps as a performer, but you know, I, I, I just think it's such an interesting thing to teach children that you don't have to break other people down and you don't have to break yourself down, more importantly, to feel like um, you're deserving. And it's, you know, for girls especially, it's such an interesting balance. And I certainly know as a witness, I watched you walk that balance incredibly uh, well because, you know, you could have been somebody, not somebody like me was like, Damn that Kelly O'Hare, she gets all the parts. But I was always like, she is amazing. <laughs> she deserves those parts. She's incredible, and she's in, you know couldn't happen to a nicer person. So yeah, that's well. But I was gift. like, 
damn that Lauren Kennedy with that belt that I'll never have. Oh my God. Well, you know, look who's uh, look who's laughing now. Um, no, I, I have been really enjoying going through the videos and watching you and um, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but I did direct a production of Bridges of Madison County a couple summers ago, and I swear I spent like 24 hours a day in the, you know, like listening and listening to the soundtrack. And just your voice was just so embedded in my, you know, my mind. Uh, that performance was so stunning and so stellar. I, I you have that kind of vocal quality that of course it's a gift, you know, of course you're born with it to a certain extent, but you had to have worked really hard. And part of this show is about talking about the kind of discipline that it takes to keep up your muscularity and to stay, you know, fit, physically fit or at least vocally fit. I know you just lost your beloved teacher. Um, uh, and um, was she someone who really inspired you and and believed in you and thought you, you know, just thought you could make it? I mean, how did that relationship sort of culminate? It, it, it's hard to explain with her. You know, I, I know that it's like, oh, she's your teacher. You know, um, I know that that's heavy and that's a big deal. And I'm sorry for your loss, but it's a little, it's a little different. I can't really explain why my life unfolded the way it has. All I know is that I'm grateful for it. But you know, when I was five years old, I was living in, I, I grew up in a very small farming town in Elk City, Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma. And I was five years old when Susan Powell became Miss America 1981. It was the first thing that anything ever happened in our little town. She was from I Elk City. It. And I found out, I remember asking where she learned to sing like she did. She was an opera singer, you know, she sang classically. Well, she takes voice lessons at Oklahoma City University from this woman named Florence Birdwell. And I decided then and there, five years old, I was gonna go to Oklahoma City University and take voice lessons from the bird lady, I called her. That is so funny. I went to school, I, I we moved when I was in high school and I started taking voice lessons from a student of hers just so I could get in with her. I did, she changed my life. She put every bit of energy she ever had into me. Um, she. She's my therapist, she was my life coach. Yeah. Um, she tore down my walls. She, uh, she just made me, I would never be here. I would never have done this. I would have never known that the leap could be made. I wouldn't have moved to New York. Um, I wouldn't have known that this, this profession at all existed. Like I said, I didn't grow up watching the Tonys. I didn't grow up watching a live performance. I didn't visit New York until I was 21 years old. Wow. She was basically my window into the fact that this could be a life. Um, my parents didn't really know about it, so I owe her everything, and um, she's with me every in every song, every moment. That, that's so true. She really is. I mean, the <clears> impact <throat> she made on the musical theater world through you alone, and you know, Kristen Chenoweth, as you yeah. said, and Susan Powell as well, is is pretty astounding. And it really goes to show you how much educators uh, make an impact on the industry, yes. whether they know it or not. I'm sure Florence Birdwell knew it obviously, yeah. but um, it's pretty exciting and support your local arts and support your local yes. arts educators in public schools, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I can also say there can be negative, uh, you know, situations with teachers. So teachers take heart, take heart about how much influence you have over these youngins and, and to say you're never going to make it is not a, a, a worthy thing. <laughs> you know, you know, know how important your words are and your encouragement is and and how special you can be in someone's life if it's a positive thing. That's great. That's a wonderful way to put it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. oh, man. Well, it was serendipitous that you saw Susan Powell sing on Miss America. I mean, that is crazy at five <laughs> years old that you had that kind of divine focus and just went for it. That is a really cool story. Um, so I've been noticing you know, during this last year when we've all been inside these boxes that we're sitting in right now, and on our social media streams, I've noticed that you have really um, taken a lot of um, opportunities to make sure you are furthering the dial in terms of social justice and um, Broadway, like uh, racial equity on Broadway. And I, I just wanted to say, first of all, say I love that. I think that's wonderful. I've also been watching your silver linings hashtags on Instagram <laughs> as well, which also is just so great because what a terrible time, but to look for the good in it, I think it's been so great. And that's inspired me too. I've been calling it chasing rainbows. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. But um, 
How important do you think it is, or how important does it feel to you, I should say, as someone who has a platform to talk about these things and make sure that people are being educated about racial inequities? Well, you know, I don't want to put a big thing on the world like I'm going to I'm going to be any sort of educator, but sure. I I have felt so opened, cracked open and and humbled and uh, and really confused by so much that I learned when, you know, I was sort of underestimated our great open minded, equal opportunity sort of the theatrical family environment. And then to learn so much of how that's not necessarily always the case. Yeah. Um, but also to talk to many different friends, uh, friends of color who have very different stories. It's not a monolith. You know, there are different mm -hmm. stories. They've worked with different people. They've had different experiences. But what we really need to make sure is that there are just more seats at the table. We have this opportunity right now where Broadway, for the first time ever, is sort of ground zero leveled. So it's the perfect, maybe not even a coincidence, the perfect time to rebuild in the right ways. I feel like I've, I've been given every opportunity that anybody could ever have. And I, I want that for everyone. I have no fear of, of me losing out by others having what they deserve. And I, I, I want that for everyone. And I also feel like you asked me about my voice. I haven't been very active on social media until this last year, to be honest. Um, a good friend of mine who used to run my social media in the small amount that I had one mm -hmm. passed away last Christmas. And mm -hmm. I decided in her honor and also just in everything that I feel so strongly about, I started to want to have use my voice a little bit more. And I'm from Oklahoma, which is about, you know, which is I was raised with a lot of different views. And I thought if, if people from Oklahoma are looking at my platforms and I have a voice to say, I grew up there. I loved growing up there. But this is how I feel mm -hmm. about equality, about justice. Um, I, I thought that would be a good place. It would be a good place to start. That I might be able to reach some other ears uh, than just preaching to the choir all the time. Absolutely. And I hope that's the case. I hope so. I really hope that we can make room. And as one of my friends, as Zakia Young, said to me, which was so valuable, she said, "You've got to say it. It doesn't mean that people will be ready to hear it, but in some moment of quiet." Any time in the future, five minutes, five days, five years, their mind might just open up, open up enough to hear what you have said. So say it, because it'll be heard at some point. I love that. That yeah. is so true. And like you said, it doesn't take away from anything that, you know, you have in front of you or we all have um, opportunities to sort of uh, crack open and make the playing field a little more even as we move forward in the arts. And the arts is such a place where we can tell stories and we can yeah. um, educate people while entertaining them. So you're, we're softening their hearts while they're, you know, getting the message. Yeah. And I think uh, we have a real privilege privilege to do that. I certainly take that privilege really seriously here at Theatre Raleigh and what we're, um, we're producing and, and putting on our seasons. It's really important to me too. So um, I just thought that was wonderful. I'm again, uh, admire the way you're living your life and how you're speaking. So it just was something I thought it would be interesting to talk about. Well, thank you. I'm glad to talk about it. Yeah. Well, let's let's break down some characters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm really interested in talking about Light in the Piazza, since it really was the show that solidified your star on Broadway. And um, I know you had a little bit of an interesting trajectory with the role. Can you talk a little bit about how it came about? Sure. Um, you know, these things, again, I'll never know why or how. I'm just grateful. Um, I was... <laughs> I was doing um, The Sweet Smell of Success on Broadway and I, it didn't go well. I had signed a year contract and it closed in four months. And it was this, uh, you never know what's gonna happen from something. So it closed in June. I quickly auditioned for this random theater workshop out in Sundance, Utah at the, at the theater lab there, playing this crazy avant-garde production with John Kelly of Children of Paradise on roller skates. I mean, crazy, grapes on my head. Um, and there just happened to be this other workshop, half of a musical being written by Adam Gettle and Craig Lucas and Ted, Ted Sperling, who's the music director and then would go on to be my music director for years mm -hmm. in many different things, um, had seen Sweet Smell of Success. He said, oh, that girl sings. She could come over and be a, sort of a placeholder in the, in the role of Franca, which is the sister-in-law. Right. So I randomly got put as a placeholder, as someone to read the part in this musical that would change my life. 
And um, we did it. And even though I'm not right, it wasn't right to play, play Franca, which now I look and I say that led to Francesca at, at some point. <laughs> right. but I wasn't necessarily right for it. I just fell in love with it. They wrote it around me. So by the time it went to Seattle and then Chicago, I was I kept playing her. But something was bothering them about the way the the role of Clara was working as far as musically and the voice type and physically. And so by the time we hit Broadway, I moved into the role of Clara. Um, so it was a very uh, strange emotional uh, journey for me there because we had really invested in the way it was before with beautiful Celia Keenan Bolger and Vicki mm -hmm. Clark and I, and we were a family. And so it was a very strange thing to sort of break up the family and lots of things kind of ensued and there were auditions and there's lots of things. And finally I, I ended up playing her. So getting into it was just rife with emotion and heaviness. Um, and by this time by Broadway, I'd been doing it for five, you know, three to five years or whatever it was. And, and I, I loved it. I, I, that that it's haunting you know if i hear it if i hear something from it it's like it pierces some deep part of my soul but it was so full for me that i did the show for about eight months or whatever it was and i left i left to go to pajama game because i i think emotionally just i needed to um i needed to go away but also i had the chance to play a woman again and by the time i played clara i was sort of outgrowing that ingenue thing <laughs> in my mind in my heart i was sort of tired of playing the stand there and look a certain ethereal way. <laughs> and, um, and so I left to play babe in pajama game because I wanted, oh. to, wanted to plant my feet, you know, and be, be tough and be sexy. And um, so, I, you know, I think everything leads to something else. But, but Piazza is just one of those things that has every version of my heart all wrapped up, up and around it. Heavy, joy, everything. Well, and when you were creating Clara, how was it um, in terms of, I mean, listen, I love this book. Obviously, it was based on a book by a North Carolina writer. So I, I have a special place in my heart for this book. Yeah. Um, and she came from Greensboro, I think, or Winston-Salem. Sorry. Winston-Salem, I think. Yeah. yeah. And um, But she had a tragic accident. And so I had a brain injury. And uh, so she had this, like, innocence and uh, childlike quality. How did you prepare to play someone with that kind of a disability? Well, you know, that was the, that was the intriguing part for me. Um, when you write something that's fictional based on this, you know, this short story basically, or, um, novella you, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Novella. Um, when you write something fictional, you're writing a person that, that needs to w exist in this fictional world. And so when we tried to put her into a human form, you know, a person like me coming out of acting school was researching blunt trauma to the head, uh, what that does to your, you know, your sexuality, what that does to your physical movements. I was like going dark. I was like trying to get in there to understand her, but we needed her to be this ingenue, this sort of simple. And I remember Stephen Sondheim came to the show during previews and I, I shudder to think of the people who only saw these particular production uh, performances. He, his note was, I need to see more of what ails her. I need to so see more of the handicap. So for a couple of days, we improv rehearsal, sort of, um, you know, the, the you know the childlike behavior, the dress over the the mm. head, the grabbing of the crotch. You know, actually the the hands stayed. I don't know if you noticed, but the hands stayed. The rest mm. of it we eventually had to drop because the love story wasn't coming off. You know, mm -hmm. being doing all this stuff in front of this man and him not thinking that's strange. You know, yeah. we had to drop a lot of that, but we went full. I mean, I tried to be brave and I tried to do everything we improved and put that in tonight, put that in tonight, um, really childlike behavior. And, and it was an interesting thing to realize that we, I wanted her to be so authentic and truthful. And yet to tell this story, we had to in, in, invent a, a person that really doesn't exist in this world. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Which is hard for me because I always go from the, of course there were things I could identify with, but you, you, I always go to the real human side of any story if I can. And this one was, uh, was not as much. Well, that kind of brings me to another question is when you are creating a role, whether it be Clara in Light in the Piazza or any of your characters, do you 
you know, do you, obviously you, you, you're studied, you just told me you were, but how, what's the ratio between like instinctual in the room and playing mm -hmm. off of people and the research and the time you put in ahead of, t ahead of time? Well, I learned so much in those first years from Bart Shear, who directed me in that show and then yeah. beyond many other shows, in, in that he does this, he really talks about layering. You know, you come in with every bit of information and the dramaturgy that you sit at the table, you do the table and you come in with, I had done the blunt trauma to the head research. I had done Winston-Salem. I had done a Southern girl in 57. You know, I had done, I'd done everything that I needed to do. And you do that and then, you, then it's there. It never goes away but you lighten that up, you strip that off. And then you have a layer of, of what it means to look into Matt Morrison's eyes, you know, and you, and you, you like, how is he gonna talk to me tonight? And how will I, what it feels like to have Vicki Clark leading you and, and carrying you so beautifully. And, and the audience was quiet today. The audience was loud today. I was really sad today. These are, it's just layers upon layer upon layer upon layer. And so every show had all those pieces in them but some days, some things would be just like in our own lives. Mm. Some days we're on top of the world and sometimes we're low, but we're still Kelly, we're still Lauren, we're still mom. Mm. It's the same thing in a role. You have, to be, you have to be flexible to live naturally and purely and authentically in a person on the stage. And that means to be different every single day. I love that. And it's kind of what you said before about the family aspect of the community. You know, you can't act in a vacuum. You're obviously yeah. going to be working off of the people who were in, in the scene with you. And I love that. That's really cool. Yeah, you must. Um, I wonder if you ever doubted yourself, you know, not just in, um, you know, one particular character. I don't know, but if anything comes up along the way where you thought, oh my God, I'm going to be fired. <laughs> I am yesterday? Not yesterday? Is yesterday too soon? <laughs> no, I mean, come on. I think we're all, we go into this because we want to just immerse ourselves and be better and learn and change. And I mean, that's for me. I'm, I remember hearing Dolly Parton say that she goes toward the pain, like she walks into it, where some people put it down or push it away. Or I, I always have done that. And, and in doing that, I constantly feel like I'm not enough. Or, but, but I want to be one of those people who's a positive spirit who says, we are. And so ask me on any given Thursday, and I might mm -hmm. say, you know what? I deserve this. I'm here. I've worked really hard. But most of the days, and, and I'm glad about this. I don't apologize for this. Most of the days I think I have so much more to learn. And there's, I'm excited about that. You know, that's not perfect, or I may not be worthy of this. You know, when I did, um, I bring up Sweet Smell of Success again, which again was my first role on Broadway, um, because a, the girl who was playing it before me had been fired. When I stepped in, you're shaking in your boots. You're like, they're obviously, and, re and really you look back, just like Clara and other things, they didn't necessarily know what they wanted with the character. And this is an advice for everybody because I learned it the hard way. If you are depending on everyone else to put it in front of you so that you can just do it and be, you're not bringing anything to the table. And at the time I was so afraid of being fired and not being right. What I really needed to do was say, let me help you build her because mm. it's part me. I will be the one to make her real. So she shouldn't say that. She won't walk there. She won't do that. She should do this. How, what do you think about that? Exactly. It's a very collaborative process. It's not diva. It's not pushy. It's what do you think about this? Because in my heart, I feel this. And if I had been stronger then, if I had not been in a straitjacket, which is the way I see it in my mind, of fear, the straitjacket of fear, mm -hmm. then I would have been more productive for everybody, not just me. Um, and so I learned that. And from then on, I started to use my voice. And even when I doubt, I must, because that helps me discover too. That's absolutely right. That mm -hmm. is 100% correct. Because too, I mean, I feel like I learned that very valuable lesson too late in my career as an actress too, when I went to the other side of the table and you realize that you are waiting for that person to walk through the door, who is what you see as the seed of what the role can be. And you are expecting that person to bring themselves to this role. And well, I, as a director, 
want you to. You know, I want yeah. to hear what you have to say and I want to craft it around that particular actor. Um, it's very meaningful. I always like to say to people I direct, like, you're the expert on this role. Like, let's talk about it. Yeah. Tell me what you think. You know, you know this person, you're embodying them. You know, let's go. So that that's cool. That's really great that you learned that, really, honestly, that young. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for it, absolutely, yeah. I'm still learning okay, it. So, I mean, well, that's what's kept you at the top of your game, to be honest, is that you're still learning, you're still striving, and still wanting to know if there's more you can do and learn. Mm -hmm. So there you go. There's the gold, y'all. Um, so King and I, yeah. I don't want to, like, overplay the whole like oh my god you want a tony thing but seriously like you want a tony <laughs> i mean you want a tony there you are yeah Look there it is <laughs> yes that is like yes yeah. um i love that that feeling must have been so incredible can you just for those of us who like dreamed about it like give yeah, me a little, sure, tell me a little sure. like what was that like you know i i it's it's funny all of us have dreamed and you know i i when it really started to be something that i wanted that I really wanted, that I knew about and wanted. I never did write down a speech in all those years, but I, I remember laughing recently with somebody because I used to take long runs on Riverside. I swear I, I gave so many speeches on those. I was like, and I just want to thank, and you know, and they were so profound, you know, and then of course I get up there and I'm like blubbering. But um, my heart, you know, it's, it's, I liken it to, if, even if I would know what this feels like, and my heart exploded. I. Um, I didn't expect to win. They, I'm not saying that to be actually at, at all uh, humble or whatever that is, false hum, with false humility. I hadn't even been nominated for a drama desk that year. Kristen had won every single category, outer critics, drama desk, drama league, everything. And then I wasn't even nominated for, for the pre previous. So I just didn't, I, once again, with my parents sitting next to me, I thought I did that little talk to myself. I was like, <laughs> okay, you don't need this. You tell yourself you don't because you, you love your work. You're so lucky. Yeah. You're so blessed. So when it, when Neil Patrick, Patrick Harris said my name, my heart exploded. I just wasn't ready. And uh, you'd think I would have been by then. But uh, when I got up there, and then I did say some of the things that I thought, of course, I forgot things too. But um, I was I was truly shaking. I was truly shaking. And I was so proud and so emotional. And then the next day, um, I was so tired. And I did a couple of shows. I did Tuesday, Wednesday. And on Thursday, we had our CD signing at Barnes & Noble, you know, when you do those things. Yeah. And my, I was like, my face started turning green. And my body just, my body literally exploded inside. And I could not move. I got to the theater and Ken Watanabe's like health guru rubbed out my body like he he was like, something's wrong. And he like rubbed out my body and I made it through that show. But what he did was he spread my fever and I got the worst flu of my life. And by Friday morning, I could not move. I could not lift my head. And um, on all the way, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'd never missed shows for being sick in my whole career, maybe one. It was just one of those people, for, for yeah. people that, that just never would miss stubbornly. I should have missed more, but for personal reasons, but Tuesday, I tried to go back in the show and I, I couldn't, and I went back home. I mean, I did the show, but I mean, I could barely get through it. I went back home, tried to get better, got back into the show, had to leave it intermission, first time in my career, hopefully my last, couldn't sing. Um, I did a couple of shows during that period where I literally was like, getting to know you, getting to know all, about you because I couldn't sing <laughs> but I would do I was stubborn I was trying and I could not get well because I they kept saying when are you coming back when are you coming back yeah but I, finally I got in the show I made it through the fall I got sick again in October same symptom same thing I got the worst flu would not go away same thing happened in February it was one what? of those and I think I attribute it back yes I was overtired yes I had a baby I had a you know six-year-old mm -hmm. six year seven-year-old and an 18-month-old at home but um, I think my body just exploded. I or let go too. Yeah, Maybe there's a part of just like yeah. you know, you just released something. You know, yeah, I it released know. like what ten years of <laughs> ten, ten years, years of, of just like I've got this. <laughs> Uh, you deserved that flu. You deserved to sit, to lay and do nothing and just kind of not have to work hard. Bless your heart. Yeah. That, that must have been crazy. It must have felt really weird. 
of course I was beating, like I was, I, well, of course I, you were. I was like, I gotta get out, I gotta get, you know. I know, no doubt, because you're like, now people are coming to see it, and like, I should be there. I just won the right. Tony, I should be there. I'm yeah. sure you felt that way, but you deserve to like kick back. Your body was telling you to do that, true, apparently. True. Listen to your body. That's why yes. I, when you're, you should miss once, once in a while to rest yourself, and I never, I pushed too hard. Now I've learned my lesson. Oh, me too. Oh my God, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, well, I want to play a little video. Like I said before, I'm obsessed with your voice and obsessed with um, Bridges of Madison County and, of course, Jason Robert Brown, obsessed with him and your And he with you and he with you. Oh, well, I mean, I'm <laughs> lucky to have worked with him and have a collaboration with him. But it, Bridges was so special. It really was. And your performance was so incredible. And it must have been such a treat to have that music i mean let's be real written for you and uh, it just is so stunning and i want to show this video because it's a little bit of behind the scenes it's a little bit of the um recording session which i'm sure you've seen this before and some b-roll as well so ladies and gentlemen sit back and relax and listen to the beautiful kelly o'hara and steve pasquale <laughs> will be it's impossible but this thing this is bigger than what we can see this is destiny we are tied we are locked we are bound this will not be reversed or unwound whatever fate the stars are weaving we're not brave Spinning by in just one second You and I have just one second And a million miles to All my life I have been <laughs> it's killing me. I haven't seen that one in a long time. You know, I think what's making me cry is uh, we're so wrapped up in so much, Lauren, and as you know, being a mom, but in that recording, see, that was before everything, before the cast, that was before the Broadway, and I, I can see my baby, my new baby, on my body and my face. I just had her, I think maybe the uh, month before. I think that was September or something. She was, or October, she was born in September. And uh, I can see 
I can see my my, my nursing yeah, and, like, and just the way that felt because I remember it was all pre-recorded so that I mean the the track so we could sing to it but that middle part and we're like how are we going to do that I can't hear like I don't know when to come in and Jason said look at me and and I looked through <laughs> and he you know every single thing and and I remember feeling like we're making music. You know? Oh God, I know. I love that little moment where you guys had like, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a lot of cute moments. If I had been able to show the whole thing, it was really fun. Um, I feel you too. I remember very specific things about when I was pregnant with my daughter, performances I did, and just they they have that place. I mean, it is like marked in your muscles, yeah. and you just in your brain. It's just a it's a very cool experience to have those time markers with shows that you've done and I do and, every single yeah. one yeah that's so cool what a wild show to be doing after uh, becoming well you were already a mother I'm sure it was your second child right 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 no yeah. she was she, yeah my daughter's my second so it was right yeah. after that uh, but, uh, South Pacific was my son's oh yeah. right absolutely yeah. which was I, even I worse because that's a swimming suit <laughs> and cartwheels <laughs> Oh my God. So how long did you do South Pacific while you were pregnant? I did it for five and a half, like to five and a half months. But then I came back when he was three months old to Girl. finish. Yeah. And so I was back in the swimming suit, like just. Oh. Just being like, really? Yeah. Why did I think this was a good idea? <laughs> yes. Please give me a skirt. Can I have a swim skirt? <laughs> well, you know, it was the 40s. The, yeah, you know, right. A little more meat on the bones is fine. Yeah. Well, good. I, I succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> no, you looked gorgeous. I saw all the pictures. Oh, yeah. I never got to see you do South Pacific, but um, uh, yeah, Charlie can tell you. Charlie, Charlie has Ellie said many amazing things about it. Oh, um, okay, well, I think I want to just do, <laughs> before we bring out our um, other participants, I want to show a couple of little uh, photos of you, not in a swimsuit, but in a little ballet uniform, perhaps. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. <laughs> I mean, so tell me about your dance career. <laughs> yeah, that's about where it stopped right there. That was uh, that was the height. That was, that was oh, my yeah, climax. And there right you there. go. Well, yeah, but that was like you... a year later. So I guess it went for another year or so. That was my cowgirl uh, jazz recital. Um, yeah, I took dance for about two seconds. And then... Um, then my legs didn't stop growing from that point on, but the oh. torso did. So I didn't have, <laughs> I didn't dance much anymore. Oh my God. I mean, were you just like, I'm getting myself ready for Miss America. I've got my, I guess. Hat I don't know what I was go. thinking. Yeah. There's that's uh, that's high school. Seven oh, brothers, so, seven brothers. Yes. It had to be, had to be all those boys. And yeah. just you. And their long underwear. <laughs> yeah. Oh my, that show needs a revival. <laughs> I don't know. Is it maybe it's dated and weird? I can't remember. I did it at the musical theater of Wichita. Um, That's where I got I, my start. Musical theater of Wichita. Are you kidding me? I didn't yeah, know that. My first professional two summers, uh, junior and senior year of college. Oh my God! Well, Wayne Bryan. Wayne I, Bryan. We, Mark we, we, a lot of us have him to thank, and Mark Madama. Um, yeah, right before I got Sunset Boulevard, I had been at the Music Theater of Wichita. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yes. Yes, and Mark like coached me on my audition for my like that audition for Sunset Boulevard and I got it. So I really do have to thank him. Oh yeah. Um, well, I say we bring out some of the participants. I think we should start with Faith Jones. Faith um, is going to join us tonight. She is someone I have worked with, and I personally chose these people because I thought they would really get something out of getting the chance to speak with you. Sure. Faith and I did um, a production of Ragtime together at Playmakers. Is she ready to come out? There she yes. Is. Hello. Hello. Can friends. everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah, you sound great. And Kelly, I just okay. want to preface it with Faith is somebody who has an astounding voice, mm -hmm. an astounding okay. soprano belt <laughs> extraordinaire. She can do it all, Thank big and you. small. She's an incredible, also a songwriter. Um, so wow. anyway, Faith, tell us, I just said a lot about you, but why don't you tell Kelly a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, I'm a singer, songwriter um, based in Durham, North Carolina. And I come from a musical family, so I've been singing my whole life. And, you know, things have quite shifted for me in my prospects of life and art. So I'm really in this, like, exploratory phase right now with music and performing, given all the stuff happening, the pandemic and whatnot. And I just graduated from UNC, uh, from the Department of Music there uh, mm -hmm. last, yeah, last summer. 
Um, so I know it seems like so long ago. I know time. I just keep saying time doesn't really exist right now. So that's the wave I'm riding. Um, but yeah, I'm just really honored to be here and so inspired by you and, um, you know, your humility and your authenticity. And I almost cried watching that clip of the performance because I have my, it was just so full in my headphones and I just, I just miss, you know, people singing together and the feeling of that and, Mm -hmm. and watching all these, you know, instrumentalists come together to make that sweeping score come to life in the recording. Like there's just nothing like that. And so, yeah, I heard you like, you know, singing so open and beautifully in my ears just now, (laughs) just like filled my soul. So um, thank you so much for having me, Lauren, and glad to be here, so. Yeah, well, what do you want to ask Kelly? Well, you know, like I said, these are really unprecedented times that we're living in. And, you know, more than ever, we've had to adapt as artists. Um, And you kind of talked about flexibility a little bit, but I just wanted to ask you, um, given your, you know, long career with many more years to come, how have you, how have you seen yourself um, adapt as an artist? And what advice would you give to artists like me who are just starting out, you know, with professionally pursuing musical theater performance and songwriting, um, all of that, which you have a lot of experience in, what advice would you give us um, to be adaptable in this uh, climate? Yeah, I mean, I know that it is it is incredibly challenging and, and confusing time about like how even to take a step forward uh, into something that seems very precarious right now. And, you know, I want to tell people, we all in our careers walk forward and say, what's my story? What's my story? Somebody asked you, what's your story? And I keep going to this idea that, you know, this is your story, Faith, right now. If you're starting right now, this is your story. And you just said you're a writer. And I have to say, in this moment in time, you know, the, the pandemic in 1918, the Spanish flu, nobody ever wrote it down. No, there is no, there's no history, real human history of it. Nobody talks about exactly what was happening, how it was felt. And I guess right now, instead of being called to work where a producer's taken care of it and a director directed you and someone's doing your costumes and all this stuff, we, I'm looking around me and it's not just my thoughts. It's, it's, I'm being inspired by how much, um, uh, you know, creativity is going on in this moment right now. So Mm -hmm. people aren't just waiting for a job to land on them. They're actually creating their own thing. So like, so if you're a writer and you're writing songs and you're singing them and you're talking about this moment, you don't have to be specifically historical about it, but I'm talking about loss, you know, discovery, uh, you know, whatever it is that you're writing about, you'll build something out of it. And I promise you when we get back up on our feet, which we will, you'll have this nugget that, that other people won't have. You'll have this, this thing that you did with your time and then you'll present it uh, in a way, whether it's a solo show, whether or not you make it yourself, like you make a big backing, somebody produces it and you have a big stage play all of a sudden. I say, just don't waste any of this precious, precious time to, um, even I have been lost in my work because it's just been laid out and I've, 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 you know, I have things in a row and I'm so grateful for that, but I didn't realize that I wasn't really thinking through what I wanted to say all the time or, or what I wanted to be doing. And this, the quiet in this time has made me say, hey, I, I wanna produce something or I wanna do a documentary on something or I, you know, and these product projects have been like popping up because of this emptiness in my head where a space was, mm-hmm. could be filled, you know? Mm-hmm. So my advice is we will come back. So when we come back, what are you gonna be holding to present? from this moment that you can immediately have to say, go, let's, let's, let's fly with this. Cause I promise you, um, even if you're doing a Broadway show or whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna do solo shows, Faith, you're gonna do them and you're gonna have a story to tell in those solo shows. And this is your time to have that nugget. Like what was happening? Who was I seeing? Who was I building this life with in this moment? Who did I learn that I don't want to be around anymore? Why? (laughs) Like, what were the things I took with from this moment that taught me so much about being quiet and being still? Um, Patience. I don't know. Just keep creating. I I think the um, the real death here would be to just you. You know, you said time is not existent, and it is like we're in in holding. But don't Mm -hmm. treat the creativity like that. This must Mm -hmm. be like 
this is your chance. Because once you start working, you're going to get busy. You know, you're going to get, and you are, you know, like being in a show, like being in ragtime, whatever. You're going to the show. That's your job. You're doing it. You're giving all your heart to that. We don't have the, the space to be saying like, what do I really, really, like, what do I see out there right now that I can write about or feel? And uh, just keep creating because you're going to use it. I promise you'll use it. And it might be your ticket, you know? <laughs> it might be your thing, you know? Yeah. Thank you. That Appreciate is such good advice because, you know, I'm sure, Faith, you sit there and think, well, I'm wasting time or like, oh, my God, why can't I just get it going? But, you know, yeah. I know that you, you already are utilizing, too. So this is such great justification that you're on the right path and you're creating your yeah. own destiny for sure. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Well, I can't wait to see what's going to happen with you. Yeah, I know you me got too. A lot, in that heart, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot in that heart and a lot in that brain. So we're going to be excited you. to see what happens with Faith Jones. Yeah, let me know. And if you write a part for me, I'm here. <laughs> Keep you in mind. <laughs> My people will talk to your people. Okay. I good, love good. It. Thank All you right. so much for joining with us, Faith. Thank you. Thanks, Faith. Bye. Bye. Yeah, we'll hear from her. Don't you worry. Oh, I will. Um, she's good. incredible. Good. Okay, let's bring out Connor Nielsen, who's also a UNC grad, an incredible actor. He's a theater rally favorite as well. Connor, this is Kelly. You want to tell her about yourself? Hi, Kelly. It's so it's so great to meet you, and thank you so much for having me here, Lauren. Um, of course. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I'm a, an art actor and an arts administrator, uh, also based in Durham. Uh, during the day, I coordinate uh, community-driven public art programs downtown Durham for, uh, for my day job. And uh, I was born and raised in Charlotte, and I studied dramatic art at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, where I met and did several shows with Faith. Uh, and uh, I've been working on a professional level for about three years, uh, starting at Playmakers Rep in Chapel Hill uh, and North Carolina Theater. And then I was lucky enough to join the cast uh, as Puck in Theater Raleigh's uh, school tour of Midsummer Night's Dream, directed by Lauren. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for that, Lauren. That's a real joy. Thank you and for I that plug to for our tour. And that one again. <laughs> but um, here's my question for you. Uh, first of all, it's just been great to hear already how, like, how you speak about how you view your life and the characters you played at different points stuck with you. Um, I, I do the same thing. It's great to hear that, like, you've taken the, the care and time to keep that spark and that, like, the magical, mystical feeling about the connections between the characters, like, growing and evolving. Yeah. Um, so, like, looking back on your various, you know, experiences building characters, how do you approach interpreting, like, a golden age leading musical theater role for a contemporary audience? And, like, how does that differ from how you approach new works? and other media like TV and opera and documentaries or whatever you're doing? Well, thank you. I love that question because I love to say I don't, there's no difference. There's zero difference. Um, <laughs> because I think that uh, if you ask me golden age versus a new piece, a revival versus something being written for me. Um, yeah, I know that another version exists of that revival, but I keep telling young people, um, you know, when we play a character, yes, it's written down on a page, and yes, someone else played it, but it's it's only going to be worth doing at all because you're putting yourself into it, and that makes it different. So, therefore, um, it's it's special. Like, I mean, whether or not it's good or bad, but it's a special situation because I, I like to try to take every character and not ever look back at the revival, not look at the other performances. I don't rewatch anything. And if I haven't watched it at all, that's probably better. And I just read the material. And then I see what the nugget of it is that I understand, uh, whether it's the farm wife aspect of Francesca in the Bridges of Madison County, because I certainly didn't grow up in Naples, uh, Naples Italy, Napoli. Uh, but I was uh, the daughter of a farm wife, the granddaughter of a farm wife and a farm kid. Um, and I, I was the, you know, daughter and granddaughter of women who didn't necessarily get to do everything they wanted to dream, they dreamed of doing, things like that. Yeah. What are those pieces that you understand? And in revivals, uh, Anna, I was a mother, I was protecting my child. I, I could imagine what it felt like to be a widow with, with no job, trying to take care and support her children. Um, I, I wanted to see what other cultures were like. You know, you just put in what you, what makes you human into that character. And so, in other words, the center of this idea is that truth is truth. So authenticity is authenticity. So if you're doing television, say, versus theater, sometimes truth is whispered, and sometimes truth is yelled across the mountaintops. 
like in opera. Truth is for everything out to the back of the house with no microphone. Theater, truth is a little louder. And on television, sometimes truth is a whisper, but it's the same intention. There's nothing changes. Some of the technical aspects, like I got to hit my mark and the, the camera's there as opposed to the whole audience is there. But the acting part is just, um, it comes down to logistically the size of it, but it's absolutely the same thing. And uh, research and, and um, study should all be the same and humanity and truth should all be sought after. That's a really lovely way of saying that. <laughs> there you go. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. <laughs> Great question, Connor. Yeah, really good. Thanks. It's important. This is a really wonderful show. <laughs> uh, she, Lauren, she, she does a good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think it's uh, really interesting to get to hear from, you know, somebody like you, Kelly, who has had vast experience and um, matching you up with people like Connor Faith and Avery, who's coming out next, who I think have a ton of potential. And um, it's just exciting to make that connection for them. So thank Great. you for being here, Connor. It was really great. Thank you for taking your Sunday night. And um, I wishing you the best. And I sure hope I'll see you soon. Thanks, you too, Lauren. Great to meet you, okay. Kelly. Thank Bye. you, Connor. Thank you. And then yeah. last but not least, I know they're so awesome. Let's bring out Avery Zimmerman. Avery, hi, Avery. <laughs> also an incredible singer. She is um, recently, well, probably two years out of high school now. Am I misspeaking or am I right? Yes. Um, she was just recently with us uh, for a theater rally show. Avery, why don't you tell Kelly a little bit about yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Avery. I'm 20. I am native to Raleigh. I'm a singer and an actor. I just started kind of dipping my toe into working professionally with Theater Raleigh, so that's been really, really cool. And I think I learned so much for that. Um, and I'm really just kind of figuring out what my path is going to look like. We are in a parallelogram all of a sudden, so I'm, it's it's very different now, and I'm just kind of learning what I can now and doing what I can. Good, good. That's a great place to be. Be where you are. Yeah, good. exactly. Um, so my question was, you touched a lot on it with Connor, but when when you're developing a character and it's a show that maybe is based on a book or a movie, mm -hmm. and then maybe it's a show that is completely original as a musical, and then maybe it's a show that that has been played a million times by a bunch of different people. So I was going to ask kind of how those differ in regards to like building your character, getting yourself into it, yeah. um, making sure it's authentic and, and you, but also staying true to the script. And also maybe getting maybe out of your head when and not thinking of other performances. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, if you have the opportunity to not have seen another performance, <laughs> you're lucky. You know, of yeah. course, I did, I've done a lot of Rodgers and Hammerstein, and I grew up on all those Rodgers and Hammerstein. Oddly enough, I never saw the movie of King and I. I really still haven't. Um, I, I don't know why my, that was one that we just didn't, my mom saw it, but she really uh, raised me on a bunch of other ones. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that, I think it's really important to, to you know, if I went and compared myself, I mean, what, what was I to do? Go watch Meryl Streep in the Bridges of Madison County? Right. <laughs> Just be like, I give up, I quit. Um, no, you have to see why this moment, this version of this person is different this time. And, and when I said the only reason to do a revival or anything is because you have something to say with it. So if you're going to revive something or you're going to do something that was in a book that lots of people have read and had their own mind about, you're not going to no, you're not going to agree or people, not everyone's going to agree with your interpretation. It's just not going to happen. That's another thing to kind of put in the, your back pocket and understand. Um, we can only do what we know to be truthful and that cannot be what everybody wants. That's not the way the world works. To think that everyone will love us or agree with us or you know or think it's the best performance of the world is to kind of to really be climbing up an uphill mountain that never ends so what you have to do is you have to say i can at least be honest i can at least be authentic and true to me so i had somebody say this is a good example i had somebody say about kiss me kate well you just weren't really right for it um I think vocally I was, I think I wanted to sing that sort of high soprano tough, you know, and, and full of 
lots of fun coloratura stuff. Um, but I think what they meant was their version of this actress, this diva actress, this selfish, tear the scenery off, mugging sort of uh, like, again, diva, I say, um, they needed that. That's the version they loved. That's the version that they first saw. That's the version that they see is right. See, I am an actress and I didn't want that version for myself. I didn't want, I didn't, I wanted to prove that a woman who's heartbroken, spoiled, she's an actress. Mm -hmm. Those are things are all true. I wanted to find her heart. I wanted to make it a little bit different. And so I don't, and even, even in that comment for one of the first times in my life, really, because I take things really hard, I was actually, I disagreed and I was proud of myself, not to them, but just in my head, I thought to myself, that's okay. That's okay because I, all I could do was make it authentically me uh, through Lily, through the words, through the material, trust your material, but what I could bring to her, otherwise it would have just been like every other version. And I didn't want to try to be anybody who had come before me. So. In other words, you, if you are being authentically human, then you will be relatable somehow. And some people will hate you for it and some people will love you for it. Um, but what you can't do is pretend and try to put on something that has no connection to real heart because then you're liable to fall on all grounds, on all, in all corners. Yeah. One thing you can do is walk out and say, I knew what I was doing, I was close to it. I was true, I was honest. Same goes for auditions. You know, you walk out of the room and say, I might not get that job, but I, I really was in the center of my truth right there. I sang well, yes. you know. It's the same thing every night on Broadway. I wasn't my best night, but I was in the center of my truth. They may have hated it, but what, I, what can you do? That and ultimately, is, that's, that's, your, that's your ticket. That is so great. I'm so glad that you said that. It's so true. Avery, please take that to heart. Yes, you do yes. not want to be a second rate somebody else or, you know, a cardboard version of somebody else. And first of all, you aren't. <laughs> you are very <laughs> authentically you. But um, Kelly, I could have used that advice about 20 years ago I myself. No, no. I was hey, I did, it, I did it too. I, all the time. I, I think I really shot myself in the foot a couple of times and learned some big lessons. You know, when I was trying to sound like Lauren Kennedy, if you guys know her, um, I, I would go in as opposed to going in and singing what I sing and then having them say, oh, well, that's at least you're a singer. Can we talk about maybe I got my first job in Jekyll and Hyde because I sang and I sang operetta for a pop musical because I, I decided I shot. My, I went in trying to sing pop at these different auditions and I left them thinking I wasn't even a singer at all. They just thought uh, she's terrible. So why would I ever do that to myself anymore? No. It's so good. And when it comes to auditioning too, I feel like, you know, there's this whole thing now where you have to have a book and it has to have a thousand songs. You have to have pop, you have to have rock, you have to have folk, you have to have country, you have to have this, you have to, I'm like, I sing the music that makes me dance for every audition. You know why? Because that is the center of my truth. Yeah. That is what I sound best on. And so if you want to hear me be a good singer, that's what I'll sing. Yeah. Well, you do, you go in with what is your truth. And then, you know, someone behind the table, if they're if they're ready and willing, like this, like it was in that particular audition for mine, my first Broadway show was, okay, can we work on this? Can we do a work session? Can you straight tone that? Can you do that? And then all of a sudden we were we were cooking with gas. But had I gone in there and saying like <laughs> or whatever, you know, I would they would have kicked me out and never seen me again. Well, so I'll just add a little fun anecdote that my husband just reminded me of. I went in for Clara and Light the Piazza when you were offered the role and I belted it. Yep, ladies and gentlemen, belted it. I, I, <laughs> no. think, I think Clara's been belted a lot. Well, I think, I think it was really horrible and I think Adam Gettle was like, that was not it. I mean, you were you, but that's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> and, and that's okay, that's okay because, you know, that you were you and they were like, ah, when I write my next, my, what my, uh, my next is, well, I'm gonna call up Lauren Kennedy. <laughs> or they were like, that girl crazy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just no, thought that was a did. funny story. <laughs> you know, I tell you what's the hardest thing in, in all of that sport of belt. It's like, when stats stay alive. I mean, forget it. Uh, I can't there you even are. think those notes. I can't right, even think right, them. Right. right. <laughs> so all that being said, Avery, you do you, and you are very unique and beautiful and special. So um, that's awesome advice directly from Kelly O'Hara. Yes, yes. Just, be uh, uniquely you, Avery. Yeah. Yay, thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight.
Mm -hmm. All right, stick around and keep watching. Kelly, um, I, at the end of the show, I'm going to run a video that I think will be very apropos to what we were all talking about. But you happen to have the kind of voice where you really can do all of it. Um, and we're going to sh showcase that later. But before we get to that, um, I usually do a, a silly game where I just ask a ton of questions like really fast, rapid fire. I'm gonna only ask five because we started late and I don't wanna take up too much of your time. Okay. But, um, you know, I call it 10 for 10. So like, just give me um, the answer, like within 10 seconds, you know, just like say it really fast, okay. ten, 10 words or less. Well, that's hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> just don't think hard. about it, like <laughs> instinctually just be like bleh. Okay, here we go. So um, what accomplishment on stage are you most proud of? Ridges of Madison County. What accomplishment off stage are you most proud of? My two children. What is one of your fondest memories of childhood? Uh, being at my grandma Marie's house with my cousins. Okay. Assume that you have a tombstone. What would you like engraved on it? She was humble and authentic and she, no, she did no harm. <laughs> she did no harm. That is true. That's what you did. Okay. What positive adjectives would your friends and family say to describe you? Uh, empathetic, uh, uh, you know, hardworking, um, you know, loving, hopefully, and, uh, uh, and, uh, that's good. That's 10 yeah. words. We yeah. got it. Okay. Now, last but not least, what negative adjective would your friends and family use to describe you? Sensi Oversensitive, uh, you know, uh, type A, controlling. <laughs> Um, uh, I don't believe any of that. I don't believe a word of it. Um, you truly are a genuine, beautiful human being who deserves every bit of success you've had, not only on stage, but off stage as well. Um, I know that you're filming something right now. You want to talk a little bit about that or can you? No, I totally can. And I'm so excited. Well, first of all, there's just been this web series I've been working on for seven, since my daughter was 11 months old, which is crazy called The Accidental Wolf. So we're right now, we're also filming that. We're wow. getting it all done with the second and third seasons. But I've started filming back in November, um, a year ago, November, before the pandemic, mm -hmm. I had finally booked a television show after all this time trying. Amazing. Uh, called the Gilded Age for HBO by Julian Fellows, who, who it's, the, it's sort of the Downton Abbey for America. And it's That's all incredible. I think I was- uh, and, and so Tell me the name one more time. I think I was laughing when you said it. The Gilded I mean, Age. So, oh, the Gilded, Gilded, okay. so the Gilded Age in New York uh, was just just oh. awful, horrible time where just there was too much money, too much. That's where all the, our buildings in New York City come from that look like ridiculous. Those were homes. Uh, so it stars amazing people like Cynthia Nixon and Christine Baranski and Nathan oh. Lane and Audrey McDonald. And, amazing. Uh, we're filming it. And um, we, so we finally, the pandemic shut us down. We were going into production that, that week. Um, mm -hmm. But we started back up in September. I started in November and I've been filming and so right That's now. That's amazing. Uh, and today's probably your day off. Yeah, today's my day off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not Thank filming you for spending day, so your day filming. off with us. That is really generous. No, this is awesome, Lauren. Oh, I really appreciate it. And I know everybody's appreciated hearing what you had to say, especially Connor, Faith, and Avery, and myself. Uh, um, okay, but I want to just end the night on something really fun. Now, this is a video. It's a long video. Just I'm warning everybody, including oh. you. But I think it's worth playing the entire thing. Um, it is an incredible um, tour de force of a song um, where you get to do everything that you do, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm going to play the whole thing because everybody needs to see Kelly O'Hara uh, just killing it on every cylinder <laughs> every single cylinder ladies and gentlemen here she is again singing a seven minute song Kelly O'Hara hit it boys not for something totally different right all right here we go hold your hat y'all I'll tell you a little story about myself Georgia wasn't good enough for me. I'd sing country songs for them, but my heart sang love O.M. And it didn't help me move to Tennessee. Nashville's not the place you sing, I see. If you want to sing it all, you best sing country. So I picked up how to do it pretty fast. Be a country star. I'll 
sing opera one day. It's like Opry with an A. I told my agent in his fancy car, and it pained him, I could tell. When he said no chance in hell, they won't let you in the opera if you're a country star. Is it the way I say obligato? So I took that country singing job and shoved it. And I headed to the Met in NYC. I know that stage is hard to reach, but Domingo likes a peach. You should hear that tenor voice sing rockabilly. Now I'm trying out for the barber of Seville. When a voice booms from the house, from those tassels on your blouse, I can tell you've got a twang and play guitar. <laughs> I bet they love you in the South, but please don't open your mouth. We can't let you in the opera if you're a country star, cause no patron trusts an opera in the hands of a country star. Do you think I can? Well, cause I got long pink fingernails. I had to play more country songs just to stay afloat. Grabbed a man, got ready for a kid. Though Lascala never called, my ears still get enthralled when I hear a great soprano blow her lid. So head up to the opera house, I did. But as vibrato start to shake, I feel my water break. <laughs> I'd never even make it down the aisle If you'd have been there, you'd have seen From that second mezzanine First ahead, then two feet From my $90 seat As I lifted up my gown To the doctor for a Now, a crib ain't where you're 
pearls of wisdom. <laughs> but listen up before you've cried a word. When you hear no, don't get upset. It means yes, but just not yet. Fight the most when folks say you're absurd. In the end, I believe we all get hurt. But if I may suggest one rule before I'm no longer cool, what you do ain't always who you are. So if you find your heart is set on both Memphis and the Met, and they force you to choose, screw and fall. I just happened to have this hat for another reason sitting right here. And when you started playing that, I was like, I gotta get my hat. And it's been so many suitcases that it's completely ruined. Oh my God. You're just ready to go at any time. <laughs> right. Who wants me to sing uh, opera or opera? Either way, I could do it. Yeah. Um, ridiculous. That's uh, obscenely good, Kelly. <laughs> I mean, it's just astonishing. I can't even handle it. I'm sure you're like you're watching it, being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But to me, it's astounding, and I am just in awe of your talent. What a great song! Was that written by Dan Lipton and David Rossimer? It totally was. Yeah, back back. Gosh, so long ago now, before I even had kids. Um, oh my god! So that god. would be like 12, 12, 13 years ago. Yeah. That is some good stuff. That is a great way. I thought it'd be a fun way to end the night. Um, you are truly a superstar, like I said, on stage and off. Thank you so much. I have taken way too much of your time tonight. So thank you for indulging us this hour plus. Um, as, just everybody knows that I started my career. Uh, I didn't get to take the job, but as your understudy. Oh, my God. And I've admired, I've admired, oh my God, nobody has a voice like you in the whole business, the whole business, Lauren Candy. Uh, I mean, well, no, that is so not true, but I uh, appreciate you saying that. True. <laughs> well, my life is real, real different now, sitting on the other side of the table and doing what I do. Um, I Love certainly um, can just say thank you for saying that, but I mean, mainly I just sit in awe of other people's talent now. It's so fun to be where I am and just watch people grow and flourish and be a part of like I don't know you know being a part of the next generation or uh, the next new show or something it's just exciting to be uh, doing it on this side now I really have loved my 180 degree turn <laughs> yeah that's awesome <laughs> it's pretty cool well um Kelly O'Hara thank you so much for being here and um go get some sleep because uh, you're probably going to be on set early in the morning give your family my love and please stay safe up there and um I just hope that we'll get to see you again and I um just am very very grateful thank you I'm so glad you asked me thank you and and thanks Thanks to Charlie for doing all the techno technical stuff. Uh, yeah, he's <laughs> he's also you know n new new skills himself. Yeah, hey, we're all <laughs> hey, we're resilient people. We're all learning new skills. That's right, the pivot, the and, classic and pivot. Right about it for us. So, uh, exactly. Well, thank Welcome. you so much, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Kelly O'Hara. Thanks, nice. guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. All right. Well, that was awesome and amazing. I'm so grateful that she came on to be with us and share her talent and her gift and all that amazing knowledge and advice. Um, I, I'm not announcing our next character building quite yet. It will be coming up the end of March. But in the meantime, we have Living Room Live on March 8th. We have... Ariane Mobasher as our special guest and performance. And we also have Charles Fanneth coming on to talk about a big night in the arts. He's going to be producing with the United Arts Council and WREL, an incredible show with uh, Branford Marcellus, Ariana DeVos, you name it, all the stars will be there. So um, join us on March 8th when he talks about that. And in the meantime, please be well, be safe. If you're eligible, get that vaccination so we can all gather in a theater and experience art together again really soon. All right. Good night. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>